everyone. A special welcome to those who have joined since Mass began. I, you know, it's a bit of an understatement to say that I don't have a green thumb. I generally, plants generally don't do very well around my house. I'll just leave it at that. But it wasn't always the case. In fact, one of my earliest memories of growing things was uh, an elementary school experiment back when I lived in Scotland that may be familiar to you. It seems to have been a bit of a universal thing. It's when you took a bean and took it home and put it in a jar with a, with a dampened cloth and you watched the bean grow, just as it says in the parable, first the sprout and then the stalk. And I still remember the excitement I had coming home from school each day and looking at the jar and seeing how much it had grown. And just like the man in the parable, it was mysterious to me. I knew it had grown, but I didn't know how. And I graduated from this bean plant to a tomato plant. That's right. I say tomato, you say tomato. But I was a wee Scottish boy, and I still say tomato. And after I successfully grew a tomato plant, one day, I was eating an orange. And when I'd finished, I had a handful of orange seeds, and I got an idea, and I thought, what if? And so I went downstairs, I went to the garden, and down to the bottom of the garden, and I planted those orange seeds in the ground. Well, a few weeks later, we moved from that house to another area of Glasgow, and a few years after that, we moved to Canada, to Nova Scotia. And it wasn't until after my first year at university, I went back to Scotland with a friend of mine, and I found myself standing in front of my old house, and I thought, I wonder if. And I went around the back, and I went down to the back of the garden, and guess what was there? Nothing. <laughs> because orange trees don't grow in Glasgow. Because the conditions aren't right. But when the conditions are right, and when the seed is good, all sowing leads to growth and abundance of fruit. All sowing leads to growth and abundance of fruit. In the gospel this weekend, we have two parables of the kingdom of God that refer to the sowing of seeds. The first is the parable of the farmer who sows and he sees the growth and he eventually brings in the harvest but he doesn't know how it happens. It's a mystery. It is mysterious. The kingdom of God, the growth of the kingdom of God is mysterious. Then we have the second parable of the mustard seed with this tiny, tiny seed which becomes this great shrub in which the birds of the air find shade and make their nests. The kingdom of God can grow from being very small, from small beginnings to becoming huge through continuous growth. The growth of the kingdom of God is mysterious and it is continuous. But these two parables have one thing in common and it is the sowing of seed. Now, the sowing of seed always involves an act of sacrifice and an act of faith. And for most of us today, we probably are not familiar with agrarian culture. We didn't grow up in farms and we didn't live at a level of subsistence, so we perhaps don't appreciate the level of sacrifice that sowing seed meant for people of ancient times, or even up until not so long ago, how much of an act of faith it was. There's a reason why Psalm 126 says, may those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy, because people always sowed in tears because it was an act of sacrifice. I mean, think of what we call a fruit or a vegetable. Basically, the part of the fruit and vegetable that we eat is basically the, the, the nutrition that could alternatively provide the food source for a new plant, right? That's why we essentially eat fruits and vegetables. Now, the most obvious example for us that we might be more familiar with is uh, potatoes especially anyone from Prince Edward Island who's joining us, potatoes. We all know the mighty potato and how delicious they are. You can, you, can, uh, you can boil them, you can mash them, you can roast them, you can fry them, and they are delicious potatoes. But you can also leave them in the basement, and eventually, if you leave them long enough, they will sprout, and then you plant them in the ground. Now, think about that. 
When you plant a fruit or vegetable in the ground for the sake of the future, you make a short-term sacrifice. You sacrifice a portion of your food in the hope through an act of faith that that fruit eventually will yield a harvest. Think of a potato. One potato can yield six to ten other potatoes as long as the plant is kept healthy. And so sowing seed is always an act of sacrifice. It is always an act of faith. But it can lead to mysterious and continuous growth in the fruits of the kingdom of God. Now, two weeks ago, we started a preaching series on giving. And giving is always an act of sacrifice and an act of faith. And it's about sowing seed for the sake of the fruit of the kingdom. If you think back to two weeks ago, we spoke about why we give. We mentioned that we don't give to the church. That makes no sense because we are the church. We give to the mission of the church. We also said that we don't give to the parish because of the need of the parish to receive. We give to the parish because of our need to give. And we invited all parishioners to be informed, to be informed. Being informed is the beginning of intentionality. And we invited parishioners to look at the, the annual finance report that we released two weeks ago. So just to refresh your memory, here it is. It's very colorful with pictures and graphs and tables. And we hope that all of you have had a chance to look at this report. It was emailed to everyone on our mailing list. We also have several hundred printed copies in the office. If you want to drop by in the coming weeks and pick up a copy, it is there for your viewing. We would love for you to go through this and to be informed. So that was week one. Now, week two was supposed to be last week. And of course, last week we had to cancel that homily because of other pressing issues that we needed to address. And of course, I'm referring to the crisis that, that came about from the news of the uh, discovery, the rediscovery of the, of the cemetery at the Kamloops Residential School. And, and what a significant moment that was for, for Canadians and for the church. And we're still processing that. Father Rob last week gave a phenomenal homily on the topic. You can check it out on this YouTube channel if you haven't seen it yet. And since then, we did release several other videos. And one other thing, it's an idea that came to me the other night, so f please forgive the short notice, that I'm going to be hosting today at 3 o'clock uh, a Zoom call just for any parishioners for whom that would be helpful, just to hang out for an hour to share our thoughts and feelings. Nothing planned, no big agenda, just to be together to talk about it. If that's helpful to you, I look forward to you joining me. There will be a link sent out to everyone on our mailing list immediately after Mass. But last week, originally the plan was that we would continue to speak about giving. And whereas week, in week one we talked about why we give, Father Rob was going to speak about how we give. And at the heart of the question of how is one simple answer based on the scriptures. We give in proportion to what we have. Now the most familiar example of this is the passage in the Gospel of Luke known as the widow's mite. The story that, that is told there by St. Luke describes that Jesus was in the temple watching people putting money in the collection and he saw all these rich guys putting in big wads of cash or maybe big bags of coins. Uh, back then, and he saw this poor widow putting in a few small copper coins, and he said, look, you see that woman? She has given more than all of these rich people because she gave out of her poverty, whereas these rich people have given out of their excess. They've given out of their leftovers. Jesus speaks about the importance of proportional giving. We give according to what we have. St. Paul talks about this. In his second letter to the Corinthians, he says this, in referring to a collection that was being raised. He says, so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has. Here's the thing. Biblical giving, in terms of how we give, it is in proportion to what we have. What does this mean for us? Well, put it this way. Sometimes we can focus on the actual amount that we give. And if we have 
are of lesser means, we may think that our small amount is actually a small gift. But in terms of proportionality, what you think is a small and insignificant gift may in fact be a huge and beautiful gift. Conversely, based on proportional giving, we may give numerically a greater amount and think that we're giving, well, a great amount. <laughs> but if we look at it through the eyes of proportionality in terms of what we have, what we think is a great amount might in fact not be a great amount at all. And so what is the invitation this weekend? This weekend is the invitation is, or last weekend, this is last weekend's homily I'm preaching, remember, is to do the math, do the math. Do the math. Calculate the percentage of household giving that you give to charities as a whole because we're, we're not just talking about giving to the church. We're calling, talking about giving to, to other, other organizations. Many of us give to multiple charities. Have you ever done the math? Have you ever looked at the percentage that you give according to your household income? So that's what we're... Week one, the request was get informed. <clears throat> week two, the request is to do the math. Week three, we want to look at the topic of what we give. So we've looked at why we give, how we give. Now we want to look at what we give. Now, I want to say something off the bat here. When it comes to the question of what we give, that's between you and God. Okay? I'm just simply setting the stage and inviting you to get informed, do the math, pray about it, and then this week, the step I'm asking you to take, or the, the response is to take a step to grow, to take a step to grow in your giving. You see, generosity is like a muscle. If it only grows when we use it, and if we don't use it, if we don't exercise generosity, it will atrophy. We become a generous person by being generous. We grow in generosity when we grow our generosity. And so today the invitation is to prayerfully take a step after you've gotten informed and done the math. And I want to quickly outline for you seven steps that may apply to you. Now, in the gospel today, we heard that Jesus spoke the word to the people as they were able to hear it. And that has to do with where we are in our faith. And I just want to put it out there that I'm going to speak about these seven steps uh, and I'm, I'm inviting you to receive them as you are able to hear it, to respond to them according to where you are right now on your journey of faith. So the first step is to give something, give something. And, you know, two weeks ago, I shared with you my own story that for quite a period in my own life as a, as a Christian, I didn't give anything. I had excluded myself. And so it was a big step for me to actually go from zero to something. And perhaps you're new to the church. Perhaps uh, you're, you could be a teenager who just got a job. Yeah, I'm talking to you, teenagers. <laughs> because here's the thing. We, we don't magically become generous at some point if we don't start. Like anything we, that's important in life, we learn to do it when we're young. And so if you're currently not giving anything, start giving something. That's quite a that's quite a step. Another step would go would be to go from giving occasionally to being intentional about our giving. Because before I was intentional about giving, what I did give once in a while, it, it was usually whatever loose change was in my pocket, whatever cash I had on me, that's maybe what I put in. It wasn't planned and it wasn't intentional. I hadn't I wasn't informed and I hadn't done the math. And so being intentional can mean that we sign up for, for envelopes, perhaps, or for automated giving. And that's a significant step. It also has the added bonus of getting a tax receipt uh, as well, which is, which is not to be uh, forgotten. Another step is to sign up for automated giving. Now, it's obvious that during this time of pandemic, our, our income has gone way down, and automated giving can, can make a huge difference. But, you know, I've got to be honest with you that over the years, automated giving has been such a blessing uh, in, in, in the parishes I've been involved in because sometimes people travel to go away. Even things like weather can impact collections. I remember in early years, 
in a parish when I'd wake up on a Sunday morning and look out the window and I'd see a couple of inches of snow on the ground and my heart would sink because I'd think, oh no. This means our collection is going to go down 30%. How are we going to cover the expenses that we have? This is a very real thing, but often for most of us, for many of us, we look at going to church like we do going to the movies. You only pay when you go, right? <laughs> but church isn't about being entertained. It's something we own. Remember, we give to the mission. We have to keep this thing going, and by signing up for automated giving, it makes such a difference. That's how I give to the parish. I sign up for automated giving, and I also use my envelopes for special collections as well. Another step that could be a step that we take is to increase by 1%. If you've done the math, you will know the percentage of income that you presently give uh, to the church or other charities. And perhaps one step for you could be to do the math and increase by 1%. Another step may be to try tithing. Now, again, this is accordance with faith. Uh, now, what does tithing mean? The word tithe comes from the word tenth. And in the scriptures in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, we see that the standard for proportional giving was actually 10%. Uh, this is what we would give back to God. In a sense, we have received everything from God and we give back one-tenth. For me, I started uh, tithing about 12 years, doing an, an actual honest tithing about 12 years ago. And uh, I give generally about 5% of my, of my income to the parish and 5% to other charities. I support a number of other charities as I'm sure you do as well. But again, I invite you to receive this according to your faith as you are able to hear it. Not everyone is gonna be ready to take this step, but some of you will be um, ready to give it a try. Another step for some may be what I will call lavish giving and that's simply beyond 10%. Some of us are, are, are blessed with, with more resources than we need. And some have a gift of giving and a call to give to support the mission in a particular way. And finally, a final step that may be one that could be taken is what I would call legacy giving. And this is simply about estate planning and remembering the parish in your estate planning. You know, over the last, over all my years as a parish priest, there have been many, many years where the parish has been able to take a huge step forward because of generous parishioners who have remembered the parish in their estate, including this year and last year. It's an incredible help. So these are different steps that we can take, and they're all ways in which we can sow the seed. Yes, it always involves sacrifice. It always involves an act of faith, but the kingdom of God grows only when we sow seed. It's a growth that is mysterious, but it's a growth that is continuous. You know, scripture says this, each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I hope that you can prayerfully get informed, do the math, and take a step, not under compulsion, not reluctantly, but in joy, because there's nothing greater than seeing the fruit of the kingdom of God. We may sow in tears, but we will reap with shouts of joy. Amen.